Welcome everybody to Getting APIs to Work. Today we have Phil Sturgeon of Stoplight. Hey Phil, how are you doing? I'm pretty good, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Today we'll talk about PRISM and API mocking. And I think it, it nicely connects to one of the things where, that we talked about in an earlier video where we talked about Spectral, which helps you to design APIs that are following some guidelines. You can test the designs and so forth. And then the next step probably is, okay, now I have a design that maybe I'm at least partially happy with. Now, how can I start having something that works so that others can start playing around with it? So I think that's kind of the general idea of mocking, right? Like how would you characterize mocking? Yeah, it's kind of the, um, the, the next step in the, API design first workflow. I mean, API mocking can be used to, for a bunch of different reasons in a bunch of different ways. It doesn't need to be in part of design first, but that's kind of the, the primary use case is that. Um, and so mocking at first kind of can be a bit confusing because there's lots and lots of different types of mocking in the world of programming and tech in general. It can mean lots of different things. Um, but specifically, API mocking usually means kind of taking, um, taking something like an open API specification and creating a fake API that's as realistic as possible. It's um, as, as accurate as your mock is, at least anyway. Um, yeah. And Prism is such a tool that allows you to do that. So in, in my understanding, right, Prism is basically just a little piece of software that you configure with your API description, definition, whatever you call it, and then it starts mocking that API. Now, that's that is useful because now people can start at least playing around with the API. Of course, it won't be fully functional, but it does something that's better than nothing. And Prism also, it goes further than that. It's not just mocking, it also can do more. So what, what other things can Prism do, which I actually find are at least as interesting as just the pure mocking. Okay, so Prism has two modes when you're running it as a command line app. Um, you can run the mock, uh, command and it will run a HTTP server that kind of interacts and shouts at you if you make a bad request and gives you a, a fairly realistic response based on the spec. Um, but then the um, the proxy command is the other option. And basically it, it acts as a validation proxy. So um, just like when you're mocking it, you, say, you run like prism um, proxy and then open API.yaml or whatever, wherever that file lives. But then you also pass in an upstream server and that can be a local host or production or whatever it is you're trying to talk to. Um, and there's a lot of use cases for that, but uh, one popular use case in the design first workflow is um, you're, a, you're a developer integrating with this API. Um, so you want to pass, uh, you, you've previously been kind of uh, hitting the mock server and then someone said, oh, uh, we've actually got uh, got the code base up and running. So whether that's, you know, local in Docker or it's some environment somewhere, wherever that actual API exists, um, instead of talking directly to it, you can talk through the proxy and it will kind of keep an eye out for if you are making requests that aren't accurate, you've missed a required field, you've got something in the wrong format, there's some very subtle, oh, that's a numeric string instead of an integer, all the little things that, that can trip up something, um, some, some languages. Uh, and then, so you can find out if you're making slightly dodgy requests, but you can also find out through that proxy if the server is doing something different yeah. to what it said it was going to do. So it's it's basically in that use case, it's contract testing, um, but for the purposes of of the the integrator, the, like the API client. I like the way you just phrase it. So a little while ago, I, I, I made a video that said an API is a promise, and to some <laughs> extent, what you just described is basically a very easy way to see whether everybody is just um, actually honoring the promises that, that are kind of <laughs> exactly. encoded in the open API file, right? So that's nice. Yeah, because it, it depends how people are doing it, their API design first stuff, right? Because some people will kind of come up with a nice open API thing as a planning process and they, they get that open API file ready to go. And then they just kind of go, right, don't need that anymore. Let's go code it all. And then things can then sometimes kind of <laughs> okay. turn out completely different. Um, and so when yes. I talk about like API design first and evolve, I've blogged about that a bunch. There might be some other name for it, or I might just be pointing out how to do the thing well. But um, yeah, the idea is that you kind of bring that open API file along with you and you you know evolve it over time and keep it up to date and even use it to power your code sometimes. So um, 
Uh, so kind of, yeah, you don't, you don't throw it away. You want to keep it around and make sure it's accurate. And this, this is one of those ways of helping to do that because as well as the like API consumer using it to check up on a different API, like you can actually run this um, in your end-to-end -end test suite. You can run the Prism proxy. I, I did it at a previous job where we just kind of, we swapped out, there's an end-to-end -end test suite. We just swapped out all of the Docker Compose stuff. And instead of running the, um, the application container directly, we would pass all traffic through the proxy, right? Um, so we just kind of like okay. sneak it in there. And so we basically added contract testing to like 50 APIs without touching anything in the in, in those APIs themselves or really like rewriting our tests or anything. We just kind of did a little bit of Docker Compose jiggery and then we just yeah. had it and it would it would blow up if anything went wrong. So that was pretty handy. That is nice. That's that's you just testing 50 APIs for are you all keeping yeah. your promises? <laughs> exactly. Another thing that you mentioned was that it's not just this idea of going from mocking to proxying, but it's also that there can be a smooth transition between those. And I found that pretty interesting as well, because I think that also allows you to as quickly as possible start with the mock and then as quickly as possible move on to the proxy model. So what, what would the, be the reason for such a smooth transition between the, the mocking and the proxying? Yeah, uh, it can it can get a bit tricky when you've got a, a mock server that's running, and then you've got um, kind of some functionality has been developed, and they're like, you can start integrating with this bit now. Um, <laughs> yeah. In the past, I've seen people kind of throw the entire mock away, or maybe the mock's actually the same code base, and they've like they've hard coded the mock stuff in there, and they've gone right, get that out of get that hard coded JSON out, and put the production logic in, and then there's like bugs in there. And like, well, now I'm mm -hmm. kind of screwed because the, the API is broken and I don't even have the mock anymore. Um, and if you do have the mock server over there and you've got the um, production or development or whatever, the implementation somewhere else, um, then you have to put this awkward logic in that's like, when I make a request to this endpoint, go to the real yeah. one. But if I do this endpoint or like, you've got to like hack your SDKs and it all just gets a bit of a mess. So um, yeah, uh, basically what the API developers can do is they can, um, for every endpoint they haven't yet implemented, they can put like a, just a return status code 501, which is uh, not implemented. Um, and that will okay. let Prism proxy know that like they've not done that yet. That doesn't exist. Um, and it can just use the mock instead. So you get a bit more of a kind of seamless uh, approach. So yeah, that's smart, right? So basically then the, the implementation says, I, I can't yet keep my promise because I haven't implemented it. And then yeah. the proxy can just uh, throw it in. Um, I like that a lot. And um, so, so that's definitely, I think something that, I mean, the more you're actually doing kind of continuous development kind of things, I think the more this specific bit will be very helpful. Mm -hmm. We also talked about one last way how you can use Prism for, for doing things and which that one evolved around test environments and using Prism in, in that kind of context. So can you tell us a little bit more about where, where this becomes relevant and why Prism might also be interesting for this kind of thing? Yeah, it's a bit of a kind of possibly like an advanced topic or power user type thing, but um, I have heard successful stories of people basically using um, Prism to stub out uh, real implementations in a kind of distributed environment when they're doing testing. Um, so you can imagine scenarios where you're trying to API A or test a client of API A um, and A talks to BCD and um, yes. maybe that's quite hard to run all those tests. You've got a whole bunch of stuff going on. And um, if, your, if your tests need um, A, B, C, D to all interact you know, realistically, then you can't really stub any of those out, but also maybe your tests are a little bit kind of wide in their scope and some more targeted tests could be useful. Um, but if you just wanna say like, okay, I'm gonna test the, the workflow where when I talk to API A, um, it's going to get some information from B and pass it on to C. And I don't really care about D. Let's just get D out of there. Um, what you can do is just run a mock of that and it will just return with something. You'll probably get like random values back, right? Like Prism, if it can find example values, it uses those. And if it doesn't know, it just says like string. <laughs> or if you say email, it'll give you like a random email, right? Um, so like those, you can't really test business logic of the Prism mock because it doesn't, 
do business logic. It just gives you stuff, but you can use it to at least shortcut uh, a service that you're not really interested in talking to or testing the, the return values of anyway. Yeah, I, I like that story. I mean, of course, like you said, right? You can't expect um, wonders from a mock. It, it can't just replicate the business logic, but when it's good enough, to just have an API that basically all it needs is to respond with a valid data structure, then I, I think it can be very helpful here. <laughs> yeah, it's something we actually tried to avoid, uh, to avoid as we're kind of planning the functionality of Prism. There's a lot of other mock tools around that it, there's a bit of a slippery slope towards making an actual API framework or like an API CMS or something like that, where you kind of had more and more functionality in and like, here's a way to add custom logic and here's a way to do this. And people oh, start saying, can, yes. I, can I deploy the mock? <laughs> I need to write unit tests for my mock. <laughs> like, no, now you've made an API framework. <laughs> that, that's a good point, actually. Yes, I think that's, that there is. it is a slippery slope for sure. But all the stuff that you were talking about so far is stuff that you can just do with Prism. It's an open source tool. Like you said, it's a CLI based tool, but it also is part of Stoplight, right? So it's part of the, the suite of tools that you can use in Stoplight. So can you just tell us a little bit about how it is integrated into Stoplight and what you can do with it there and the different ways how it, it gets kind of deployed? Yeah, where it's showing up. Um, yeah, so pretty much everything at Stoplight, there's open source tools that power most of what we do. Um, the, the hosted platforms and the software just kind of glue a whole bunch of that stuff together and make easy workflows for you so you don't have to kind of duct tape and string it all together. But a, a lot of stuff is available for free. So like, I don't work in sales. I'm not here to sell anything. Um, <laughs> so you can use Prism um, on the command line for free. Um, if you're using Studio Desktop, which is our kind of open API GUI, it's like a visual editor that's available for all the operating systems um, for free. Um, if you're using that, then you'll actually have uh, Prism running as a local host for you, so you don't need to use the CLI. Um, this is quite handy for um, if you have slightly less technical people that would like to interact with it, that maybe don't know how to run Docker Compose or don't know how to run a command line script, you know, they can, they can just see what that JSON's doing. They might use a HTTP client and play around. Technical writers might want to give that a go and just, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, in Studio uh, Studio Desktop, um, and it's also in, we have a hosted version of Prism, which means if you're using Stoplight platform, um, that's like the Studio web editor, so you can do it all on there, and it's Docs, and it's Explorer, and all these cool, cool things that are all integrated together. There's a hosted version of Prism, so whenever you um, push your Git or publish your web project, um, it will update the documentation, but it also updates the mock and then the docs will point to the mocks. So people can interact with your hosted mock server on your hosted documentation. So that's pretty cool then in the sense that whenever I update my, my designs, I, I have a very simple way how just the mock that is available to anybody pretty much, right? Just up, self updates, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah, and if you're using Git-based projects, then as soon as someone merges a pull request to master, and if that you know pull request has open API changes, because yeah. we recommend you put your, your your docs and your code, your specs and your code in together. Um, yeah, as soon as someone merges a pull request, then your docs and your mocks are all up to date. So there's just kind of one version of everything. And I've had that problem in the past where I'm trying to like duct tape all this stuff together, and there's CI processes trying to re rewrite the Jekyll website and publish that to S3 and trying to like update this other mock service over there and they've kind of got out of sync. You know, ah. uh, so yeah, that just, it just does it <laughs> much easier. Yeah, you can make it work, but it's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, manual labor, right? So yeah. I think it's, it's nice if it just happens. Good. So I think, is there anything else you would like to add in terms of, you know, what other things might be interesting around Prism, why people might want to check it out? I just think it's a really interesting tool. It, it provides very convenient functionality for a couple of things in sort of typical API development. It's free. There's a, yeah, <laughs> it's nice. Um, did, so did we miss anything? Yeah, I think it's probably important to point out if you are an API developer, you might not see as much value in this, but it's not necessarily for API developers. It's it, it kind of is in a way. It's really just to give people who might be integrating with your API a way to give feedback early on when you don't have all of the kind of sunk cost of all of the in, uh, time investment and all of the code written. So um, if you can give your users, your stakeholders, the other people that are going to have to work with this API, if you can 
um, give them something to give you feedback on, um, then they're going to feel like you care about their opinion, which is nice. <laughs> um, and yeah, generally it will avoid you having to rewrite as much stuff. Um, it can help you avoid needing to kind of make version one, then version two a month later, because you missed something obvious. Um, and yeah, generally getting a few different clients, a few potential clients, even if they're not planning on actually working, uh, integrating with it for, you know, six months or whatever, try and gather as many use cases from as many different people as possible and get it in front of all of them and then say, try and build something. And, and if they're saying like, oh, I had to make a thousand requests to do the thing I wanted to do, you might have designed your API a bit badly, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and if they're like, oh, I made this one request, but there's infinite data on this page. I got like, you know, a whole bunch of JSON back and I just wanted these like two fields. You might have designed your API badly, right? So that, that sort of stuff can help you with Goldilocks sizing. Um, I didn't know that was a phrase, but Jason Herman, our CTO, used that the other day. Of like, don't just normalize your database. Um, don't shove everything into one mega download URL, like try and find what's right for the use cases. And I think Prism really helps you do that. So it's a valuable part yeah. of the design process, not just like a thing to make a fake thing. <laughs> Thanks for saying all of this, because I really think, you know, like you said, like you might think it's not relevant for API developers, but on the other hand, right, it's really important that as an API developer, you care about your consumers because that's yeah. the only reason why an API exists, right? So that it gets for consumed. Sure. <laughs> and the better you make it, the better you, uh, the, the more you can improve it, right? The better it will be for your API in the long run. So. Thanks. Thanks for that educational <laughs> message in the end. I think we can't no say that enough. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much uh, once again for joining, Phil. It was a pleasure. Yeah, it's always and, great. Um, okay. So I hope everybody you enjoyed that video. If you did, please um, consider subscribing. And with that, we're done for today. Thanks, everybody. And um, have a great day. Bye-bye. Cheers.